Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovery. It's brought to you by our friends at knowyourscript.org. They've got a lot of information there, so if you're wondering what to do when talking to a doctor about your prescription, go there. They've got a lot of information. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do this podcast. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. He's a clinical psychologist. You know how I know? Uh, I told you. Well, you walked in with your name tag on. Oh, I did, yeah. Does it ever get old have people going, hey, doctor, hey, doctor? Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, like an average guy like me, no one will ever call me doctor. Right. You know what I mean? So I don't, I guess I'm used to it. I don't understand it, but is it still a thrill? I I wouldn't say it's a thrill. No. Really? It usually means I'm working. Oh, but that's good. Uh, most of the people that work with me after a little while, they usually just call me Matt. I'm, I'm pretty informal guy. But you know what? I and, and that's what I love about you. That's what I, when, when we used to come on the TV show that I had, I loved it because your doctor speak is not like a normal doctor speak. You know what I mean? You're, you're ground level. And like when you say stuff, it, it makes sense. Other doctors are like, I don't know what you said, man. Well, I appreciate that you appreciate that. Um, that is just kind of how I talk. And uh, I I don't know I don't know a lot of big words so why try to impress people? That's with them, not right? true. <laughs> you're, you're you're always reading. You're always ahead of the curve, and uh, you usually bring something good to the podcast. Now I'm putting you on point here. Okay. Did you bring something? Is there something for us to talk about to conversate before we get to our guest, who's going to be an amazing guest, and it's dealing with pornography and addiction. Right. And, I'm excited and, and, about and a our lot show of that. Too. And trying to get guests to to come on the show and share that part of their life is is really hard to believe it or not. Well, of course. I mean, most of the things they bring on to the show are generally considered private, right? That's our private business. But there's a lot of value in sharing that with others. It kind of breaks down walls and stereotypes and creates a connection. And what do we always say the opposite of addiction is? Connection. Right. Now, let me ask you that because you are a therapist in your daily practice. Right. I deal with a lot of youth Mm -hmm. and uh, kind of some uh, older clientele as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you deal a lot with pornography? It's a very common thing to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. I would say that a week doesn't go by that I don't have a couple, several conversations about it. Do you think pornography is more prevalent today than ever before? Do you think it's a bigger problem? Absolutely. Do you think it's because of the accessibility or do you think both? uh, Really? It's it's, uh, because of access. Now there's more content out there. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you and I were growing up, if you were a curious kid and were kind of wanting to maybe see what that pornography stuff was all about, it, it, the access wasn't immediate. No, no. I mean, you had to actually search for it or be walking through a field and kick over a box full of pornography yeah. and be like, holy cow, look what I just found. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that was really the kind of extent of it was. Or there Absolutely. was a room at the local video store that was way in the back that you weren't allowed to go in. You weren't allowed to go in there anyway. Yeah. Um, so, so when we were growing up, it's not the kids didn't see porn and that there wasn't a lot of pornography. Mm-hmm. But what we do know today is it's instant access on any digital device. You can find pornography easier than you can find anything else. Therefore, there is more content being created. People can create content as a business and put it on the internet and boom, there you have it. There are apps and lots of different things all centered around this multi-billion dollar industry of pornography. And to put a point on that, uh, we've had pornography be the subject of the podcast maybe three or four times in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you say there was one time that Chris Rock came out to a sold out house to do his stand up comedy. Yeah. In fact, uh, if you have Netflix, which everybody does, you can watch Tambourine. It's his special from a couple of three years ago or something. Mm -hmm. Where he goes up and he's he's talking about some where he's been because he was kind of out of the scene for a while, not doing stand up, and he had gotten divorced. And he talked about his pornography addiction and and how he you know that was a part surely a cause for his divorce. And uh, he this the place is just dead silent. Mm-hmm. And then he makes a crack. He's like, oh yeah, multi billion dollar industry. I'm the only one in here that looks at it. But and it- everybody starts laughing because the tension. So what was interesting was. Not just what he was saying and admitting to his pornography addiction, but it was the emotional reaction of this crowd of thousands of people. Everybody's holding their breath. That's how we feel about pornography and admitting to looking at pornography in our lives. Everybody 
keeps it private. And as soon as he made a joke about it, then everyone had this big laugh because they knew, yeah, we're all busted. Like, you know, think about it. There was probably multiple people in that audience sitting next to loved ones or a high percentage, I'm sure. and, And just going, oh. Yeah. You know, not knowing what to do. And yeah. that's why we started this podcast for this kind of reason. Let's bring this conversation out into the open. Let's have it in the upfront so we can figure out best ways to deal with this. Because right now, I mean, I can, I've got a list of people willing to come on this podcast and talk about being homeless, shooting up needles, stealing their kids' lunch money to buy drugs, telling some of the hardest stories we've ever had to hear. But I, it's hard press to find somebody to come on here and talk about pornography. I've actually had people, you know, who listen to our show say, why don't you have more people come on and talk about pornography? I'm like, well, you try to find somebody that's going to come on, you know, and talk about it. It's not an easy thing. I think the reason that uh, Alcoholics Anonymous has the second A is because there was a time when you couldn't admit the stigma. To, 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 ha- to being an alcoholic and having a drinking problem without maybe losing your job and all these sorts of things. Well, we've gotten way past that now, and people talk about it more openly, and even the hard drug use, like you've said. But it's interesting that there's so much shame about pornography because I think it's a sexual thing and it's a private thing. Uh, and it's associated with being, uh, you know, a pervert or a deviant person. Right. And so people really hesitate to talk about it. Um, you ask if I ever talked to people about it. I had, um, a visit with, um, we'll say early teens, uh, kid just within the last week where, uh, he wanted his mom to join us for the visit. And I thought, well, that's a little weird. Okay, sure. And she came in because he had talked to her about it. And then, uh, you know, he wanted some help to talk to me about it. So even in a therapy setting with somebody I've known for a long time and we've worked on a lot of personal things, he still wanted support from his mom who he had talked to. And therefore, kudos to this mom to have that kind of relationship Mm -hmm. with her son that he would talk to her about it because he knew it didn't make him feel good. He felt compelled to look at it. And we talked about you know, why that's a normal thing, that sexual curiosity, especially at his age, low impulse control, all that kind of stuff. But then afterwards, he felt badly about it. And even in in that household, you may be thinking, well, that's a lot of shaming. Actually, in that household, no. That's a household where a lot of open talk about pretty much everything. I don't get the sense that shame is part of their conversations. And he still felt bad about it and wanted to talk to me about it. And so we talked about ways to help him you know, reframe what he's done so he doesn't have the guilt and shame Mm -hmm. and then uh, behavioral uh, and social ways to help him stay away from using pornography as he gets older. Uh, One of the things that is a big problem for pornography is the stimulation that it causes and the positive uh, endorphins that you get, the dopamine and all those. It becomes a drug. It, It is very much a drug and it can become associated, especially with young boys, with self-soothing. So when, a you know, because pornography gets combined with masturbation and that's a a release that feels good to the person, of course, your body's designed that way. And so young boys often when they're growing up, I mean, you remember what it was like being 12, 13, 14, you're full of, you know, testosterone. So you might be kind of angry sometimes or irritable, frustrated, things aren't going your way. You want to feel better. And if boys learn to turn to pornography and masturbation as a quick way to bring that feeling down and soothe themselves, then it can become an addictive process. Now, instead of learning how to manage their own emotions, their big feelings, how do I manage anger in a healthy way? How do I manage um, embarrassment in a healthy way? Um, Many adults still struggle with that. it's, It's not that different than turning to an opioid. Or a beer. Or a beer. You know, it's not that different than going and getting high every time you're frustrated or you get a bad score on a test. And some boys learn to go to pornography and masturbation. So it is a prevalent problem. Uh, I was, I think once we talked about, you know, like your your issue was Bud Light. Mm -hmm. Um, Pornography is sort of like if, if, if the Bud Light truck backed up to your house and just rolled up the door and just said, have at it. Mm -hmm. There's all the Bud Light you could ever want. That's the internet with pornography. You know, it's like, and it's right in everybody's back pocket. It's in everybody's front pocket. It doesn't cost a thing. 
No, that's the thing that's different. If uh, if you and I in the 80s wanted to find pornography, we might find an old, you know, wrinkled up magazine somewhere or we'd have to pay somebody for it. Nowadays, you have an unlimited access to unlimited types of pornography. And believe me, that goes way beyond what was happening in the magazines in yeah. the 80s. And it, it's free to kids. So, yes, it's a huge problem. And I'm really glad we're talking about it today. And your example today, you mentioned boys. But the research and right. reality is, is that women are the grow, fastest growing population of right. pornography addiction. Exactly. So one of the things when there was more of a barrier to the access of pornography, girls who might have been a little less curious about that um, benefited more from that. Now, boys and girls are looking at pornography all the time. And you're right. They are the number one growing demographic for looking at pornography. Well, that brings us to our guest today. Her name is Christina Bradford. Uh, She does not have a pornography addiction, but she was associated with someone who does. And she's here to tell her story. We'll hear that next coming up right here on Project Recovery. And welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. Our guest today is Christina Bradford, who, when the mics were off, said you're a little bit nervous. Just a little bit. <laughs> why, now, why? Now, first off, let's get to why did you want to come on and do this podcast? Um, because I want to be a source of of help for anyone who might be going through this, maybe an ear just to listen to anyone. I was alone through most of this journey, and I would have probably, I would have done better had I had more support. So I want to be a support. And your journey was you were in love, married to someone who was addicted to pornography. Um, yeah, he he's a sex addict. A sex addict. Yes. And we're going to get to that, but your story began a little while back. And yes. uh, you said, uh, Dr. Mastek, we'd like to know a little something about your upbringing. And you said your upbringing wasn't that good. No, it was not. Why? Um, well, I am the daughter of an alcoholic, and it was just a, a toxic a toxic childhood. My father wasn't really around much, and my mother didn't find – she found sobriety for a while, and that was a wonderful time in my life, but that didn't happen until years later. So at the age of 12, I started – smoking marijuana and cigarettes and somewhere in there she found AA and she went to AA and was working on her recovery and we were left just to kind of go wild and crazy. So we pretty much, we lived in a neighborhood where there was a lot of gang activity and there was a lot of other stuff happening and we just kind of went wild and I ended up graduating from high school somehow, but I guess I should start a little bit before that. I was kicked out at 16. um, From your home or from high school? From my home for being kicked out of high school, for not going to school. Mm. Just set up for success immediately. (laughs) (laughs) I've always found that uh, the kids who are struggling to be at school, the the solution is to kick them out. (laughs) So here's a quick story. I'm going to tell you this. My older daughter had seminaries her first period, and I was getting a call from the seminary teacher going, your daughter keeps missing. So I finally went down to Presley, and I said, hey, look, you got to go to seminary. I don't want to talk to your teacher anymore. And so you know what my ex-wife did? What? Gave her homeschool for that first period. I was like, so you rewarded her (laughs) for missing it by giving her no school. And I'm not LDS. And I says, you need to go. You made a commitment. <laughs> the non-LDS dad is trying to get her to yeah. a seminar. I was like, I don't care yeah. what it is. If you make a commitment, you, see, you, it till, I agree with you that. see it till the end. And if you don't want to take the next yeah. semester, then don't take then don't it. Don't take it. But right, I don't yeah. want any more conversations with your seminary <laughs> teacher. <laughs> and so you were saying you got kicked out of school. And so your mom's response to that was, well, you're out of the house. Yeah. And there was a lot of turmoil before that. Um, I was you know, following in my sister's footsteps and she ran away quite a bit. And so I ran away from home and I think her struggling with her own issues just Mm -hmm. couldn't handle it. And so, I mean, I, I survived, I found a way to live. So, but, uh, but I'm curious, where does a 16 year old run away to to live? Right. Well, um, there was lots of coming and going. And one time it was in the middle of winter and I had some friends I knew very well, and they had sold – well, they had bought another house, so their house was vacant, was up for sale. And I moved into their pool shed and lived in their pool shed for a while. And I actually knew a lot of police 
uh, in Sandy very well because often my mom would call the cops on me and I got to know them very, very well. And they often would come and check on me. And I can remember one time, I, I didn't want them to come and check on me because I didn't want to go through the process. At that point in time, it happened. It was like a revolving door. I'd get kicked out. I'd go away for a little while. I'd come back home. She'd call the cops. I'd go to youth services. This was like just a pattern for me growing up. And this time, I snuck away. I went to the right friend's houses over the weekend, and they had come to the pool house to try to get me, and I the wasn't police there. Had? Yeah, they had. Oh, okay. And then uh, they waited for me to go there late at night because they knew I'd be sleeping there. And they came and got me. And one officer who I will never forget, his name was Officer Stacy Evans, pulled me into his car and told me that he wished he could have adopted me because he just wanted me to be very successful. And I think he knew it wasn't going to happen in my house. So there was a lot of that going on. But it's all brought me to where I am today. So, um, we- what did that mean to you that the officer would say? It? Cause that's, that's kind of an interesting thing for him to say. It's a little different than him just saying, Hey, you need to, you know, get no. things together or you're a kid with potential, you know, him saying he wanted to adopt you. That must've meant something to you at that age. Yeah. I think he knew, I think he saw the things I was going through. I mean, he was obviously at that point, a very big part of my life, you know, because Growing up where I grew up, it was Sandy, Utah, but there was quite some time where it was part of the officer's daily routine was to drive through our neighborhood. I mean, we were getting calls all the time on us as kids, and there was a lot of gang activity. And so I I think he was really just involved, and he really cared about me. He pulled me aside because he was worried about me because it was in the middle of winter, and he didn't want me to... So there was people that were dying from freezing. Sure. So throughout all of this, because this is a podcast about addiction, uh, did you ever resort to drugs and alcohol? Did that ever become a problem? Would you say that you were an addict on any of that stuff? Or was it something that you could take or leave whenever it was presented? I think I could take or leave it. And I don't know how that's possible because the programming and everything I've been through in my life should say I should be an addict. So I'm kind of still taken back by that till this day. Mm -hmm. Um, I started getting involved in powders, drinking, everything. Um, So I was kicked out at 16. I moved in with a friend for a few years. And at that point in time, we did whatever we wanted. It was very much a free range home. Um, I ended up going to Valley, and I don't know if you're familiar with Valley. At the time, in those days, it was considered last chance high. If you, it's an alternative high school yeah. program for yeah. kids that are struggling in the regular mainstream schools. Yeah, absolutely. And without Valley, I wouldn't be where I am as well. It played a part in my life. But um, if you didn't show up, there was no tolerance. You were kicked out of school. So by this point, I had been kicked out of my first high school, kicked out of my home, and I was doing powders for quite some time. It was crystal meth, and I remember being up for a while, and I remember one day just looking in the mirror, and I knew this wasn't how I was going to get to where I wanted to be. So I just stopped. I was like, nope, I don't want this for myself. And I went to sleep for quite some time, and I woke up, and I was kicked out of Valley, but I wouldn't accept that no I went down there and I had such a great relationship with everybody and they wanted me to succeed so they allowed me to come back with contingencies and I ended up walking with my class starting my junior year with only two and a half credits and I graduated on time it was wow. huge that's a lot what an of accomplishment thank you yeah so well, after- and a great lesson for people to advocate for yourself Yes. If you want something, you need to advocate for yourself. Don't just take a no yes. if you know something's best for you. And that's that was probably a huge turning point for you to to be able to make that turn around. Um, it was, but I never looked at it like that. Not mm. until I got older in my life and started reflecting when I needed to about how far I've come. I, I just kind of just stuck my head down and kept going forward because I knew it wasn't where I wanted. It wasn't going to get me where I wanted to be. It just wasn't. So that's a little sampling or a taste of your early childhood growing up. Mm -hmm. Where do you meet the father of your children? So um, I I worked in a restaurant 
Um, we met in a restaurant. He opened the restaurant from Oregon, came down to Utah, and we just started. We got along from the very beginning, and fast forward, we dated for about four years. We moved to Oregon together, and there were signs from the very beginning. And signs of what? His his abuse, his emotional abuse, his mistreatment. I was very pre-programmed to accept that because I never had a lot of love growing up. And so I was conditioned to believe that this was love. So I accepted it. And anytime there was an issue, I often reflected on what I was doing wrong. So I kind of took everything on for myself. Internalized. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so some of the subtle signs when there was no intimacy and intimacy goes beyond physical, it's emotional, it's it's spiritual. It's so many different forms of intimacy, and we never shared any. I'm going to stop you there and go to the good doctor and find out a little bit about intimacy because, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you've got to have some thoughts on this. And, and you know, sure. and to have her sit down and tell me intimacy is more than just sexual. Uh, you know what I mean? I, right. I, I've never really heard that that much. You know what I mean? Most people think of intimacy as sexual. Right. But um, there's a lot more. Give me some of them. Uh, well, for I mean, emotionally connecting on different levels is is really the root of intimacy. So, sex can, you know, has the has the possibility of connecting mm -hmm. on an, a deep emotional level. But you can have uh, intimacy in a friendship where you share things about yourself. Intimacy includes things like having trust, uh, being open. Um, uh, and having an, uh, like sharing emotions, thoughts, feelings, all of those sorts of things. And so, uh, sex is an interesting part of that in the sense that sex can just be a recreational activity for people. Like sex can be very selfish and very one-sided, even though there's another person there with you. Mm -hmm. So having sex with someone does, is no guarantee of intimacy. So the, the best sexual relationships, um, the intimacy starts before sexual contact starts, where people le learn to know each other, love each other, feel safe with each other, um, share feelings and thoughts with each other, and trust. Trust is a huge part of that. And so, unfortunately, some people grow up where um, sex has really nothing to do with intimacy. And pornography is one uh, thing that happens that robs sex of its intimacy and turns it into sort of a a selfish gratification instead of a, a mutually uh, intimate experience. So you said there were some early on flags mm -hmm. with uh, your husband. Yes, there were. And how old of a person were you when you uh, started dating? Um, I was just over 21 when I met him. Okay. But we start, we lived together after just a few weeks. And okay. I think that added to it quite a bit too. Would you say that, and and I will say this, uh, back to kind of intimate relationships, our parents are our first intimate relationships, right? I mm -hmm. mean, they're the ones that have the most intimate contact with us. And if we have um, typical parental experiences, they're, you know, they're nurturing us and taking care of us and talking with us and sharing with us. And, and so they're our first intimate relationships. Therefore, as we get older, the type of intimacy that we learn with our parents, especially our other gendered parent, has a big impact on what we expect in our future intimate relationships, what feels right and normal. And so you mentioned, you know, your, your mother was an alcoholic. And uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but generally that means that uh, there's a lack of intimacy because mom isn't emotionally available as you're growing up. And so you're not learning about that emotional connection. And then you mentioned dad wasn't around a lot. And so uh, just by his absence, at the very least, um, you're not having the types of uh, intimate, safety, trusting relationships. So it can often cause a myriad of problems for a person when they become a young adult and they want to reach out and have an intimate relationship. We all have a drive for it, or at least most people do. But if you've grown up without any 
practice and training in what a healthy, intimate relationship is, it can get you into some pretty unhealthy relationships. And I think that's what she said. You didn't know what to expect. You thought this was it. So you just put your head down and moved forward. Because that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to do your best to stay married forever, whatever it takes. You know. And that's where the big mistake is with sex and intimacy. If you don't really feel, if you didn't grow up feeling an emotional intimacy and emotional safety and connectedness with your parents in your family or whomever raised you, if you didn't have that, then it's very easy to, to think, well, what do, you know, adults have sexual relationships. That's where I'm, I'll get that intimacy finally. And uh, it's often not the case. We're going to find out more about Christina's story in just a few seconds. You're listening to Project Recovery. Hey, welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That is Dr. Matt Woolley. Our guest today is Christina Bradford. Uh, we found out a little bit about her childhood. Uh, in her own words, she said it wasn't a great childhood. Uh, she had some moments of greatness, but a lot of sadness, uh, help from a friendly cop. But at the age 21, she fell in love with a man. Two weeks later, moved in. Uh, she said there were some red flags from the beginning, uh, kind of some emotional dishonesty uh, and a lot of other stuff. But we wanted you here to talk about uh, pornography and its addiction, not your addiction, but the loved one that you shared a bed with. How does that start? I mean, wh- what was your first crack that you went, OK, there's something here? Um. <clears throat> I started finding um, emails. He would send emails to Craigslist um, asking how much and to send pictures. And when I approached him about it, he had an excuse and I accepted it. Do you mind? What was that excuse? Honestly, that was so long ago. My goodness. Um, I think he said that he, it wasn't so much an excuse. He just, I'm not doing anything. I'm just curious. There's a whole community of people out there and I'm just curious. So he downplayed it. He played me like a fiddle. I mean, he knew me. He was a master manipulator and knew me very well. So I just took all that on and never questioned anything else because he said that. So I took him for face value always. And that repeated. But in hindsight, he was soliciting prostitution. Yes. Yes, he was soliciting. It started before we were married. It started in Oregon. um, And we've been together for just over 19 years and married for 15 or 15. So it started quite a while ago. And there was from his story, there was a lot of time in his life where it happened and it didn't happen. It happened and it didn't happen. And I was caught up in all of that. I had a friend once tell me that emotional abuse is like a slow drip and it starts just a little bit. And then before you know it, fast forward years later, you don't even recognize who you are. And that's where I was at to talk about this and to tell you that he had an excuse for things. I'm so just I blow my own mind that I accepted that for what it was and never questioned it at all. Well, one possible explanation, and and you can tell me if this fits your story or not, is when when two people join their lives together, or you become partners, or you get married, uh, there is an implication of trust, at least, and it works out beautifully when both people are on the same page and giving each other trust, and and that trust can build and grow over time, and and create more of that intimacy that we were talking about. However, unfortunately, it can be the case where that changes. It may start out that way or it may not. Uh, but at some point, one person is still giving their full trust to the other person in the relationship. And that person is not deserving of the trust because they're not returning it. And that's why later, oftentimes people will say um, kind of in a almost self-deprecating way, I can't believe I did that, that I trusted him or I trusted her. But I can say, well, that actually said pretty good things about what you were trying to do in your relationship at the time. Looking back on it, we wish we had known earlier. That's always hindsight, right? But I don't know that at the moment it was necessarily a real negative comment on you as much as it was on him. You were trying to offer trust in a relationship that required trust to be successful, and he wasn't worthy of it. 
a lot of the times in therapy, I, I develop so many wonderful tools and they will say this to the partners because partners of addicts carry a lot of shame, Mm -hmm. a lot of shame. And for years I carried a lot of shame because I internalized everything, believing I wasn't attractive enough or I wasn't doing enough for my husband. And they'll say you were, you, you're not a bad person. You're a wonderful person because you believed that, that love and trust, he was offering you these things because you were giving him those things. But he was the one, obviously, who was decepting me throughout everything. So finding emails uh, on pictures. Craigslist and mm-hmm. pictures and stuff like that, mm-hmm. you confronted him, he downplayed it. Does it get worse? Does it get better? Um, well, we, we were married and the abuse got worse. I mean, I every day believed I wasn't enough. I wasn't doing enough. So I always was turning inward to see how I could improve. Never looking at the situation, ever, never asking, never questioning anything. So I um, put myself in school because I wanted him to go to school because I knew he was really smart. He's very, such a very smart person. And um, I started going to school and we tried to get pregnant for about eight years. I never could ever get pregnant. Um, He was doing smoking a lot of pot and that had a lot to do with it. He stopped smoking pot and I got pregnant. I started this program. Um, it was a very intense program. And again, I just put my head down and kept going. That was some of the hardest times because at that time he turns out, I didn't know at the time, but later he was acting out the most during those times. Um, while you were in school and and busy with being pregnant Mm -hmm. and he was acting out. And so, like you said, Earlier, pornography is part of his addiction, but you described him more perhaps as as a sex addict. Is that right? Yes. So um, I really – it's difficult because I don't want to share his story. I really – But to be fair, he knows you're doing this podcast and is supportive of it. Absolutely. He is very supportive of it because it is my story and it's important for me to connect with other people who might be going through this. And this is how I do that. Because you said you had hoped uh, you had had somebody to go through this with you because you felt like you were all alone like many addicts or loved ones of addicts do. And so you're here to kind of share your story. So you're pregnant. You're in school. He's acting out the most. Uh, Are you talking to family? Are you talking to anybody? Or are you just kind of just alone and isolating? The isolation probably hadn't started yet by then, but... There wasn't anyone to talk to about this. Uh, Like we were talking about, there's not enough information out there. And that's why it's very important for me to come here and be open about a lot of this hard stuff. Because when I did talk to my girlfriends, everybody said, what are you doing? How can are you offering enough to your husband? And so, again, internalizing all of that, I ended up getting pregnant four months after I gave birth to my first child. Irish twins. Yes. I was still in school and I was working, so I had a lot going on. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. And behind the scenes, he was also, it was some of the most abusive times in my life. Like physically, mentally, emotionally, all of them? Emotionally. Emotionally. Extreme emotional abuse. Um, You can abuse someone around finances. I didn't feel like I could go out to the store and get things for my children. Um. So it, it, the abuse was very heavy. And again, I just, I'm a survivor. So I just put my head down and dealt with it. Kept moving forward. I ended up graduating. Um, about 18 months later, I got pregnant again. <laughs> so then you were on third. I was on third. By this point, it was awful at home. It was just awful. Um, I had my, my last baby. And then about three months later, um, I had found more stuff implementing that he was doing more than just talking to them. Mm -hmm. I found a lot of things on Twitter and all of those social media outlets offer opportunities for free porn and free access to prostitution. And that's um, what just tipped me off. And we were already involved in um, a wonderful program called Namaste. It's a center for healing and they exclusively deal with sex addiction, porn addiction and other addictions because it's never just one addiction. It's usually multiple addictions that are happening. 
And so he was going there with you. We were doing it together. Um, there had been an ultimatum a few years back. I had found out some things and I told him this was before I had my children that if I had ever discovered anything again, I would leave him. And unfortunately, I said all those things and I wasn't prepared to do that because fast forward to after I had my third baby and found out I didn't leave him, obviously. So we were in the program and there's a whole process around discovery. A lot of the times uh, the addict will do um, delayed disclosure. And that is extremely hard on a partner because you have a partner who is believing everything they're saying. And every time they've just had enough, usually the addict will come in and say, okay, well, this is all I've done. This is it. And so your partner is believing everything the addict is saying. Okay, I believe you. Let's continue from here. And making an emotional adjustment to that. Like accepting level. Absolutely. Okay, I can forgive this. We'll keep going. That happened so much throughout my marriage with him. And finally, when the real disclosure came, so you're supposed to do it in a therapeutic setting with a therapist who represents the partner and a therapist who represents the addict. There is an entire process around this. And I found out all by accident via text message with my three babies in my kitchen. I will never forget it. It was a very big experience for me. So you stumbled upon some text messages and found out the whole story. Yes. And I, because this was a dance that we had done for so long, I I would often say, I would say, oh, I know about this. What can you tell me about that? And that was kind of my way of trying to get more information from him because I knew he was never telling me the truth. Mm Mm-hmm. And this last, the last time it happened, I had found the um, escort pages and I just said, I, I know you're seeing prostitutes. And he just laid it all out for me. And it was not the ideal way for everything to go. But we had an emergency session with all of our therapists. And then I got the full heavy of everything. And it had been over 15 years of consistent prostitution and he had embezzled over $30,000 and all of those things obviously were so just groundbreaking for me. I mean, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't function. I couldn't do anything just to hear all of that. My entire world had been shattered and so impacted by everything, all of my beliefs were all um, intertwined with this man and all of the lies he had been telling me for so long. Wow, that's, I mean, that's got to be a lot to process. And I mean, not something that you could process in just a day, a week, a month, or, you know, we're talking years. Well, in a, in a very real way, and I mean, this is your story, so correct me if I'm wrong, but that's traumatic. It creates a PTSD, a post traumatic stress syndrome that happens because what you're describing can't breathe, can't function, brain fog, that's trauma. That's trauma to your body. It's trauma to your brain and it's trauma to your soul. You know, that trust that you had laid out uh, as a wife and a, a partner in this family. And so it's very much a traumatic experience. And um, it sounds like you experienced what a lot of people experience when they discover you know, things of this nature about their partner, uh, it shuts you down. And uh, to say it's confusing is is a major understatement. Uh, literally, a brain can go into a period of shock uh, where you just don't function well for a while. I had to function, though. I had three little kids. But you kids. got three kids, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I had no outside support. It was me and my babies. So I did my best. And um, I kept going, but there definitely was periods where surviving was hard. Um, I I remember going to work. I remember going to work, and I remember seeing one patient, and I had a panic attack. And I I left, and I went down to the uh, other therapist and said, I have to go. I cannot do this today. And they were so supportive. They had no idea. And I didn't work that often. I only worked um, PRN, which is as needed. So I didn't work very much, and I didn't have a lot of 
uh, connection with most of the people I worked with, but they could see and they just said, go, go. And I remember driving myself into this car wash stall and I had nobody, but I had a girlfriend that I grew up with. I, she lived so far away from me. I remember calling her and I don't remember much about the conversation other than her saying to me that she She'd been my friend since I was about three, and she'd known the life I had. And she said, you are the strongest person I have ever met. And if you can survive that, you will survive this. Thank you. And that statement probably carried me till this day. And any time I really experience something I don't think I can get through, I hear her words again. And it's very helpful. So telling my story and sharing everything I've been through, especially since day one, is so important to me because you can overcome so much, especially if you try. The moment I decided that my happiness was my responsibility and I started taking steps every day, consistent loving steps towards myself, committing to myself, committing to my happiness, committing to my children, everything changed. My world opened up. So where does it, where's the situation with your husband or right now? Well, um, it took a lot of time to get through. COVID was like just a fog for me. At that point in time, I was already isolating. Um, I, my children, I was already homeschooling my children and I didn't have a lot of friends. He and I had worked somewhere together where prior to all of this, where we had accumulated a lot of friends. We had accumulated a lot of people in our lives who knew us very well. And when it kind of came out, not so much about what was going on other than we weren't going to be together due to possible infidelity, I lost everybody that at the time I knew. All my friends abandoned me. And so it was so difficult to go through all of this alone, but it had to happen, in my opinion, for it was for a reason. Mm-hmm. It was. It gave me lots of time to reflect on the situation. So there was so much abuse happening at that point in time. We had developed such a pattern um, of just toxicity. And I remember one of my children speaking to me in such a way that it was so rem- reminiscent to how I felt when he spoke to me that I realized that they were viewing the abuse and then treating me that way. And that was the day that it had to end. It's uh, pretty unsettling when you see children pick up on that modeling that uh, parents can do um, in a negative way. Yeah. And so you feel like that was that was the catalyst to having to change the the marital relationship. Right. Um, After we went through all of the program through Namaste, I mean, he was doing so much. I could see that he was trying. But without me really exploring my childhood, my upbringing, my conditioning, there's no way I would ever realize all of those things that I was accepting that were not acceptable. And there's light at the end of this tunnel. We're going to find out what that looks like. You're listening to Project Recovery right here on KSL. Welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. Our guest today is Christina Bradford. Uh, we're talking about pornography and addiction. And uh, Christina's story is that she was in love with a sex addict who had a porn addiction. And you wanted to come on and kind of talk about the warning signs uh, and what it's like being a, a loved one of a someone who addicted to pornography. Yeah. I mean, I grew up as the daughter of an alcoholic, and I believed for quite some time I had overcome all of those issues from childhood and that I would never fall in love with an addict. And I remember baiting him. I remember asking him so many questions about his childhood, and he presented his childhood as perfect. And so I kind of signed off and was like, okay, I never questioned anything. I never looked at signs. And later things started revealing themselves. He didn't have the best childhood. And there were so many other things that were there that I just overlooked. And 
I wish there had been someone there to just be a friend with me throughout all of that and maybe help me begin to question some of the things I refuse to look at. But right now you're in the process of divorcing. Yes, happily. Uh, um, and uh, you've still got three kids, but off air you told me you guys are co-parenting the best you can. Absolutely. You said it's important for your kids to know that your ex-husband is trying, is a good person, and it does a lot of good things, uh, but it's done some bad things. But, I mean, that's human nature. Right. Um, and you wanted to come on here and talk about some warning signs. So for those out there who might wonder if they're in love or they have a porn addiction, what are some of the signs that you could kind of help people see? Well, uh, physical intimacy is obviously a big sign. Um, it's often said that an addict will either be hypersexual or hyposexual. And in my case, my my spouse was hyposexual. Um, okay, I got to stop because I don't. I know what hypersexual is, but I don't know what hyposexual would be the opposite. Well, I, I mean, but is there a clinical term? What does that mean? Is it hyposexual? Is I, 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 look, I know. I, I get that, <laughs> Doctor yeah. Matt. I mean, don't. But what I'm saying is, so they're not into sex at all. So not with their partner, like right, like that. Uh, they, they seem to, you know, a, 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 like a wife. If the husband is hyposexual. Then the wife might wonder, well, does he have low testosterone, or you know, is what? Why does he have such a low sex drive? Unfortunately, in the you know, we're I think we're graduating from this old fashioned culture. But uh, one negative aspect is then, and you've mentioned this already, people sometimes wonder, well, why why isn't is the wife maybe not uh, interested enough in him or willing to have sex or you know, and so women often will blame themselves or even blame each other or try to problem solve with their girlfriends. Well, maybe you could be sexier or maybe you could do this. When, in fact, it has nothing to do. It might be he's with, just addicted to porn and right. he's spending all his energy on there. And when he comes home, there's nothing left in the tank. Right. We've talked a lot about behavior, uh, behaviorism here on the show. And one of the things that happens with uh, strong emotions is uh, activities and things get associated with those strong emotions. Well, there are a few emotions in our life as strong as our sex drive. And so when a person ha is having other sexual experiences that we might call deviant or unhealthy, pornography, prostitution, and things, you know, strip clubs, things like that, their sex drive becomes associated with those things and not with a healthy, intimate relationship that requires um, back and forth, give and take, intimacy, trust. You know, the, the, instead it becomes associated with power, control, um, and and deviance, I'll just say, uh, although that's not the most political correct word to use anymore, but that they be, the sex drive becomes associated with those alternative things and not with the intimate relationship. In fact, the intimate relationship can feel intimidating and overwhelming to the sex addict. How do you do? Pretty perfect. <laughs> and I would say this too. It's important to remember that if a young, immature brain is exposed to these things before they're able to really distinguish between the difference, their reward system is going to know note that and their reward system isn't going to go to the, the intrinsic reward it's going to go to the extrin extrinsic reward because it's so easy and that's what happens a lot with pornography it starts with something simple and as i've heard you guys say in past shows that with addicts it starts with just a little bit and pretty soon that little bit isn't enough and then the addict needs more and more and more i've talked to people who um, are you know trying to recover from a porn addiction and things just like looking at the computer if that's where they viewed their pornography or looking at a phone that's it that's a trigger because now you know you know if all you did was play candy crush on your phone then maybe your phone becomes associated with a fun you know pastime but if you mostly looked at pornography on your phone every time you got to be alone then just seeing the phone can start that mental process of being triggered in a sexual way, even though the phone may not even be on. And if you do it in routine, you've built a neural pathway, and mm -hmm. that neural pathway begins to signal other signs in your body that you don't even recognize. And pretty soon, that's exactly what you're going for every single time. You yeah. brought a children's book, um, <laughs> which is weird because we're talking about pornography and sex addiction. But what is the book? It's called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, um, Porn Proofing Today's Young Kids. 
It's an excellent book. I've gone over it with my kids several times, even my youngest. Um, and, and how old's your youngest? Uh, she's six. So I have a six, eight, and nine-year-old. And we talk about it a lot because for me, going through this experience is so important to reflect on my past. And when I, I was exposed to porn myself as a kid, and no one ever talked to me about it. My parents knew about it, and they never, ever talked to us about it. And I wish they had. Just this simple book has helped open the door for so much with my kids. Um, We often talk with the sex addiction. What people don't realize is that you don't have to have alcohol to survive, but there's a need for love and connection to survive. And for a lot of people, porn or sex addiction becomes that. And it's so unhealthy on so many levels because obviously it affects everyone. I think an analogy that I like that I've heard before on this, because I, you're 100% right, it is different than alcohol and drugs because we can live without alcohol and drugs, but we can't live without um, uh, intimacy and connection and love, or at least it's pretty hard to. And um, And so an analogy is sort of like an appetite. And it's like if you're hungry – you could have a really healthy meal you know, with all the right nutrients and things. And that, that grows your body and you feel healthy and it's good for you and you're nourished. Or you can go eat a bunch of chips and soda pop and candy and things. Swing by the drive-thru. Yeah, get to get all that kind of stuff. And in, in the short run, it fills you up, right? Like you can go eat a bunch of Pringles, drink some Mountain Dew, do all that kind of stuff. And you'll feel filled up for a minute. But then what does that do to you? It's not nourishing. It's quite the opposite. It damages your body. It's unhealthy over time. It makes you a, a less healthy person. But your brain starts to crave those things, right? There's cravings that come from, from the, the, you know, the cheap carbohydrates and the sugars and the caffeine and, and all of those things and those kinds of foods. And we forget that what our body really wants and needs is the healthy, nutritious uh, meals that really nourish us. And so I think in a very similar way, we have a very strong drive or appetite for emotional connectedness, love. And we can, if our brain learns to associate the cheap, ineffectual, and unhealthy ways of receiving that, then we get unhealthy over time. Our, our, our emotional self, our psychological self becomes damaged over time. Whereas if we learn at a young age or at any age, if we can turn the corner and learn the healthy ways to nourish our, our needs for love and emotion and connection and intimacy, then it's a, it's a beautiful life. So I, that's kind of an analogy I've heard before, and I like it because it is a little different. This is one of the ways of pornography and sex addictions are, are different than substance abuse addictions. So the book has been very helpful to you and your family in talking about sex addiction and pornography. You said Namaste Healing Center was very beneficial to you and your ex-husband. Um, I would say for anyone who's experiencing this that they 100% should invest in um, a licensed certified sex addiction therapist for the partner and the spouse. There are so many options for therapy, but you need to have someone who understands this addiction. It's not a regular addiction. It's not your typical addiction. And I agree with that. I I 100% agree. If if a person is struggling, especially to the degree that your former spouse was struggling, um, you need to go to a specialist. Absolutely. But you've also created an Instagram account, uh, and you want to be an advocate, a warrior, for this cause where people can reach out and ask you questions, mm-hmm. talk to you and, and, and kind of pick your brain, if you will, about uh, what they can do or what they're going through. Absolutely. And I want to be a resource of help. I want to express the things that have worked for me and the things that haven't worked for me because I had to do it all the hard way. <laughs> I don't want anyone else to go through that. So what if, what if, uh, what if there's a, a woman listening today who's married to a man and she's she suspects that might be a problem, but she doesn't really know for sure? Uh, would you still suggest that she reach out and talk to you or someone about it? Absolutely. There were so many questions that I hadn't even thought to ask in the very beginning. And through time and experience, I can sit here now and offer so much. And I just... 
want to be that helpful for someone, anybody. Yeah. I think a lot of times we, we have um, an intuition that something isn't right in our lives, whether it's with ourselves or with our kids or with our partners. And uh, we, we need to listen to that intuition more than I think we do. And, but, but if it's just an intuition, sometimes you need to ask somebody, you know, well, what do you think about this? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I think the fact that you're willing to, you know, put yourself out there as a resource, as a friend, somebody who can sh- like share your experience. I think that's what people need in order to avoid doing things the hard way. You need a little help up front, right? So where does it stand right now with you and your ex? Um. He's a friend. He's um, a great support system. He's supporting me coming here today. Um, If I need help with my kids, because it's not easy with your kids sometimes, he's there for me. He's very supportive. Um, I think it's so important, and that's where the program often comes in and says, you need to go work on you, the partner, and then the addict needs to go work on the addict individually and figure out who you are, where you want to be, and just heal, and then try to come back together. We never had that, unfortunately, due to our circumstances, and I don't know how things would be differently. Um, I'm grateful for my entire experience with him because and through the program because I couldn't sit here with him and sit here today and be this vulnerable if I didn't have all of those tools. So he and I together work together for the sake of our kids in any capacity because we understand that that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know the answer to this. Maybe you don't. How's his addiction going right now? I don't know the answer to that and I don't want to know. It's not it's not mine to bear it's not it's not my responsibility it's not my it's not mine that's his you have three kids that are young so as a parent uh who's been through what you've been through what would you say to other parents how i mean whether there seems to be a pornography problem in the household or not i i like to tell parents when i speak to parental groups if you're old like me then then your parents could have gotten away with saying if my kids are exposed to pornography because it was a different world when it comes to pornography in, in those days. That was still pretty iffy, but you could say if. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, I think you have to say when. When your children are exposed to pornography and then the conversation goes on. So in your experience, if parents came to you and said, at what age should I talk to my kids about what pornography is and the dangers of kids? Do you have a sense of what you would recommend? Well, because it starts so early nowadays, I think the earlier the better. Age appropriate, obviously. Um, That's why I love this book so much because it breaks it down in such a um, easy, innocent way. And it doesn't talk about a lot of those things that you shouldn't be talking about with children when they're this young. It just breaks it down, talks about the brain, talks about the pathways of the brain and why it's so important not to develop that or even expose yourself to those things. As children, it, it, it gives you a whole process. If you've seen this, so they talk about the pictures, and if you see it, what you should do. Stop, walk away, and go get an adult. And then together you guys can work on that and continue to take the right steps. Yeah, I agree with you. I remember 100%. when my daughter was six years old coming in going, Dad, the Disney princesses were just making out. Because she was just on YouTube clicking buttons, Aww. clicking buttons, and saw a picture and thought she'd click on it, and we had yeah. to sit down. Uh, then we implemented kids' YouTube, and we have that same conversation with our kids. And my son, almost every day, will come and like, Dad, I think I saw something inappropriate. <laughs> you, know, you know, and to him, he's hyper vigilant about this. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and, and I was like, okay, so then we sit down, and we have multiple conversations a day uh, about that stuff. And I, so I would think, um, the earlier, the better as well. Yeah. Well, both of you are kind of demonstrating what I thought you would, hoped you would, and that is uh, having age-appropriate conversations as soon as you have a kid who's starting to use the Internet. I, that's kind of how I tell it to parents. If you have a kid who's starting to use the Internet, if they have a you know an iPad or something like that, 
um, then that's the time to have these types of age appropriate conversations because it it is often shocking and upsetting to the kid. They don't really understand what they're seeing, but they know enough to know that this probably isn't something I should tell anybody. Mm -hmm. So they learn to keep a secret about this at a very early age, five years old, six years old, is not too early for kids to start to learn I shouldn't tell anyone, which is the opposite. We want to have open dialogues and conversations. I'd also go one step further. Parents, if you're listening to this now and your kids have their own iPads or you have one just for the kids, go Take 20 minutes and run through that iPad. See what's on there. Check the search history. You know what I mean? And see what kind of stuff is going on because you'd be surprised of what some of the stuff that's going on there. I'm not saying being intrusive and read their emails. Uh, but Mine I'm, is full of putters. I'm trying to buy a new golf putter. Right? Yeah. But, but I mean, I, I, I do that. I mean, every yeah, once in a while, yeah. and I go, hey, let me see your phone. Why, Dad? I just want to check. Yeah. Well, and I don't know about you guys, but we don't have cable at our house. We have apps. And any one of my kids can get on the TV and access YouTube yep. and search for something. Mm-hmm. Right. So, it, it, so it's it's not just the computer right. anymore. It's not just the phone anymore. Right. It's anything that can connect to the Internet, anything that is app-based. Um, I had a parent the other day say, well, I didn't know on their Nintendo Switch they could get on the Internet. It's like, well, how do you think they downloaded that game? It cost you fifty bucks, you know. Right. Like so, so we as parents need to catch up with understanding. So I agree with both of you. You need to be involved. Uh, you should put parental controls on. You should have an open dialogue. You know, what did people say? Like when we were kids, it'd be like, oh, did your dad have the talk with you? The talk, as if it was like you could get it all done in one setting, <laughs> right? You know. And the better thing is, we we really need to have open dialogue, open conversation, authenticity about the fact that, you know, um, pornography is out there. It's real. You're going to see it. And so I love that idea of that book, um, uh, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. Is that yes. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, good Pictures, Bad Pictures might be a very good place to start for if you have young kids to know how to have an age appropriate conversation with them so that they feel empowered of what to do right. and they don't learn to hide and feel ashamed because kids will do that and they don't even really know why, but mm-hmm. they will. Well, and this, this might empower them. Let's have a game plan for what happens when or if when you see that. Let's, you know, you see it. What are you going to do? Stop. Walk away. Get a parent. Yes. Well, Christina, thank you very much for stopping by the podcast today, being so vulnerable, sharing part of your story, and letting people know that it's okay to talk about this, and things do get better, and recovery is possible. Uh, It's amazing. Uh, I know it wasn't easy for you. Uh, I know you've been stressing about it, but I really think you're going to help somebody out there by sharing your part of your story. I hope so. That light is so much better on the other side. It's right. so much better. Dr. Matt, thank you for stopping by. I'm going to end the podcast now because I'm going to call my dad because we still haven't had the talk. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I, your dad kind of intimidates me. I don't know if I want to have the yeah, talk Yeah, he intimidates me too, but yeah. I'm going to have that but talk. tell me what he said. I'll yeah. be curious. Maybe I'll learn something. I will. And thank you to knowyourscript.org for con- continually, I said that right? Uh, yeah, it works. <laughs> supporting us without it's, you it's, it's kces we, yeah we, we can do it. this podcast i love you guys and don't forget project recovery is a ksl podcast of this program are for informational purposes only. The program is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, licensed therapist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this program. KSL does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, physicians, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on the program. Reliance on any information provided on the program is solely at your own risk.